Welcome back, troglodytes, to a very special edition of the Troglies Guitar Show. I found a really rare guitar today, but before we move into that unboxing and demo, I wanted to do a little bit of history on what this guitar was crafted after. The Gibson Crest model. A lot of this information comes from George Groon in an article that he had within Vintage Guitar Magazine. I have always personally been enamored with this Gibson Crest model right here. But before we talk about that one, we actually need to talk about this. This also shared the name Gibson Crest. However, as you can tell, you know, from this to this, they were not very similar guitars at all. This particular one was actually a custom order done in 1959, and there were a few also done in the early 60s. We're talking less than 10 of these things ever made. The reason why I wanted to share these today is I'd never heard of this model before, and that's always a new thing for me. But it looks like we've got some sort of a veritone switch, your pickup selectors with a strange like single coil-esque pickup there, a humbucker in the neck, a really long cutaway with the Super 400 inlays, and you get a little knight guy on the headstock, and this is like his crest, his shield. And it's just such a fascinating guitar, I need to find one of these. But the one we really need to focus on today before unboxing my rare find is this guy. It's kind of like an ES355 as far as the neck goes. Because you have the custom block inlays, you get the split diamond on the headstock, the fancy Klusen waffle back tuners. However, unlike the other one, we don't have any fancy Veritone or anything like that. It's got the double cutaway body like a 335 or a 355, but it lacks a center block, so it's more so like an ES330 in that aspect. But then we get two mini humbuckers, and get this, also kind of from certain 330s, you have the short neck where it actually joins at the 15th fret instead of all the way down here at the 19th. So generally, players don't love these guitars because you can't get to the upper frets, but it's great if you're just doing jazzy stuff down here. And not everybody is a fan of the floating mini humbuckers. But what makes the Gibson Crest so special is that it uses Brazilian rosewood veneers. And these things were produced from the late 60s into the very early 70s. And you can either have them in gold hardware like this from 69 to 71 or all the way up until 72 you could get uh, silver plating. But this having Brazilian rosewood was a big deal because Gibson had discontinued Brazilian rosewood because that's when conservationists really started to crack down. Now there's been limited runs here and there, but the crest has always hold a soft spot in my heart because it's one of the rare 70s models that you could find Brazilian rosewood on, similar to the Brazilian rosewood top Les Paul Custom. And I've personally always wanted to document one of these, but finding one that I particularly liked was kind of difficult and they were always really expensive. I mean, most dealers are asking $10,000 plus for these things, but they're such fantastic, magnificent looking guitars. So when I found what I found today, I knew I had to buy it because it's a crest, but on steroids. It fixes all all of the issues that anybody has ever had on this guitar. And I think it is going to be a priceless piece of my collection. Let's go ahead and check it out. I haven't been this excited to open up a guitar in a long time. So a little bit more on the backstory of this thing. I first saw it listed on Reverb uh, like a month, a month or two ago, and it was listed as 1980 Gibson Crest. And that immediately piqued my attention because as we just learned, the crest, I mean, the very latest you'd find them is 72. So finding a 1980, it's like, what? What is going on here? But looking at all the custom specs that it had, it's like, okay, this had to have been some sort of like a custom order. So I saved it in my watch list because this thing was listed at like $15,000. And it's like, oh, I want it. But at that point in time, I could not afford it or I did not want to afford it. But this is one of those guitars that you think about it, you dwell on it, and then you go, okay, I need this thing. That moment happened for me when I was actually filming an episode of Guitar Hunting. I was looking at all those nice expensive guitars and it's like, yeah, yeah, you know what? I think I need to buy this thing for the channel because it is just as nice as that old Steve Howe, the Les Paul, but in a different way. When I started to become more serious about this thing, that's when I actually engaged the seller and asked him some questions because I noticed in his listing, it said custom shop. 
and it's like, okay, Custom Shop didn't exist in 1980. Does this have a Custom Shop original decal on the back? Because in the early 80s, they'll have Custom Shop Edition and Custom Shop Original. Edition means it was like a, a limited run of some sort, usually, sometimes there's some exceptions. Original means custom ordered one-off. And this thing, let me tell you, it does have one of them, but that is just the beginning of the mystery. So I'll walk through the whole mystery with you guys again, because I needed a lot of photos to be comfortable purchasing this. I also asked him, how did he get it? From a guy named Lynn Wheelwright. And you know, he's had exhibits in the Smithsonian about guitars and pickups and stuff. He's a collector, I think from the Salt Lake City, Utah area. He also does like guitar work and things like that. You can check him out on Google. And I was told that he bought this in the early 80s. He kind of forgot which year at the Gibson Nam show. So you guys know it's gonna be good if this thing is a Nam show piece from the early 80s based off of the Gibson crest. Let's take a look at this thing. Here it is. So the first thing you're going to notice is, yeah, this does not have that whole short neck situation going on. So it's more so like a, a 335 traditionally. And you're going to notice we still have like the Brazilian rosewood top veneers, the side and the back. I mean, who knows? These might not even be veneers. We have to get this thing on the workbench and really take a close look at this. But what made me fall in love with this thing the most actually is not just the body. It comes down to the headstock. Wait till you see this. Does that look familiar to you guys? This thing has a lot of the Les Paul characteristics to it when it comes to the headstock. So mixing a crest with a the Les Paul and like more so 335-esque specs, I don't think this one has the center block. So I guess it's still more so a 330 in that aspect. But check this beautiful thing out. And we get the abalone inlay custom logo. You get the abalone Gibson logo. And check out our nut. This is just like they used on the The Les Pauls. It's got that scalloping in between it. Now, it does not have the wooden pieces, so this is actually the first nut of this kind that I've ever seen. But it's got all those fancy abalone inlays on here too, and multi-ply binding. We'll take a closer look at this on the workbench. But it's got a white, black, and white layer, including on the fret nibs. I mean, this is just such a fancy guitar. And don't forget, we have rosewood pickup rings, just like a The Les Paul. And if we look inside here, we even have one of the rosewood switch tips. And as far as our crest goes, we get a tailpiece down there that just reads Gibson and it's an ebony block with a giant abalone inlay on there. But here's where things get really strange. Doesn't this guitar look very 70s in construction? So we look over onto the back. We get the same thing that the crests kind of have. But here's my favorite part of this guitar is if you look right here, it's kind of like an eye and an eye right there, and then you get two noses. I am nicknaming this guitar the Hippo for very obvious reasons. I mean, look at it side by side. This is just a hippo within my wood, and I love that because I love animal references on my guitars. But when we come back here, we have a mid-70s serial number with a Custom Shop Edition decal. Now, I'm guessing what the Custom Shop Edition decal means in this particular case is that it was part of the NAMM show collection. I doubt there is another one of these. After doing a whole bunch of research, there is one more crest that was like an employee put together guitar. But besides where the neck joins the body, that's where the similarities end. It wouldn't have surprised me if it would have said that it was like a Custom Shop original. But maybe that's just how they did all the NAMM show pieces. But all the construction of this really screams mid 70s. And that little decal really did not start until like the earliest of 1982. So that kind of threw some shade and mystery onto this thing. But after a lot, a lot, a lot of photos and thinking, I believe I have a good enough of an explanation for this. really resonant sounding that has to be a complete hollow body that's all I've got to say but let's go ahead and throw this thing on the workbench and I'll kind of explain some more there for this very fancy piece all 
All right, here's the deep dive on the Hippo. So this is what made me comfortable buying this guitar, despite it having a mid-70s style serial number and construction and everything. I mean, even looking here, we have the old Kalamazoo style sticker on the inside. I asked him to pull the pickups, and when I saw this, it's like, okay, I know exactly what this is. It's got a 1980 Tim Shaw PAF. But our bridge pickup has a 1983 Tim Shaw PAF. Now, if you remember any of my Spotlight Special videos, occasionally in 1983, you will find split electronics. Half of the stuff will come from 1980, the other half comes from 1983. Now, unfortunately, the only one photo that he had from the previous owner when he pulled one of the pots dated it to 1980. So I went ahead and I bought an endoscope. That way we can see if this actually has the 1980 volume pots and 1983 tone pots, kind of like some of the spotlight specials have. Unfortunately, I just can't quite make it out. You can just barely see like that 1980 potentially three there. But I think I'm just going to have to pull the pots to be sure. Maybe we can use a, a combination of all this. It's definitely a good idea. We can like see inside like all the bracing. and I can see why some people were saying a, an endoscope might be beneficial to me, but unfortunately th this body is just a little bit too thin here to really make use of this giant endoscope. Oh well, we tried. Okay, that's gonna be a decision where curiosity kills the cat. I'm gonna have to spend hours fishing these things back in here, but I cannot own this guitar not knowing what the pot codes date to. It's okay though, because I think I need to add some washers, that way these aren't sticking up so high anyways. The first one dates within the 20th week of 1980, the next one dates within the 40th week of 1980, and then we have the other matchings within the 20th, and the other one was also within the 20th week. Some of the numbers were covered up by solder. I don't want to mess with that just to get pot code readings. We can clearly conclude that they're all from 1980. So, huh, it is possible, I guess, you could say that this 83 Tim Shaw was replaced later on. Like, maybe the guy had some issues with it, or it's also possible, you know, once again, as I said, in 83, they did, like, miraculously find a stockpile of 1980 parts that they were using, so maybe they decided to use it like that. And I contacted Mr. Leonard, you know, the guy that's actually worked at Gibson, and I asked him, do you have the serial number in your book? And unfortunately, he did not, but he was able to tell me that there were Kalamazoo-made instruments that did not get completed until later on. That's not saying that this is exactly one of those, but he was saying that it's potentially possible because he had one that had like a mid-70s serial number that was built in Kalamazoo, but it wasn't finished until it was moved down to Nashville. Now, this one being a NAM piece, it wouldn't surprise me if it actually was finished in Kalamazoo, but... Once again, there's not really a good way to know unless this video just happens to meet the person who made this guitar, right? So that's a little bit of a letdown. I was hoping we'd find two 1980s and then two 1983s. That way this would make a little bit more sense. But hey, at least we have 80s electronics and Tim Shaw PAFs. Yes, I'm happy about that. But let's take a look at the construction here. So it's a short neck tenon. You can see how it was constructed right here. They've got all the glue securing that to the body. And then this is kind of interesting. So it almost looks like it might have a center block if you just looked in it right here. However, once you're looking here, you can tell, yeah, there is no center block. But it appears that they might have constructed this kind of similarly to a 335 in the fact that it has a multi-bound layer. So you have this thin rosewood veneer and then what looks like a large piece of like poplar because these are usually maple poplar maple. But now we just got a rosewood poplar, maybe even another rosewood layer right there before they get to whatever this stuff is. Semi-hollows and hollow body guitars, they're not what I specialize in, but that's kind of a cool little cross section right there. But it does not appear to have any type of center block. There's, there's just like a block right here you can just barely feel with your finger, and that just kind of uh, gives it some support for the neck, I would assume. But we'll take a look at the pickup rings. Yeah, that is exactly what we found on a V Les Paul. They've even got the finish over top of them. We'll see that under the black light here in a minute. But this 1980 Tim Shaw, that's very early. It might still even have the T-top bobbins if we were to remove the cover, which I do not wish to do. Now the bridge, unfortunately for me, this is a floating bridge system, not normally my favorite. 
But we'll take a quick look under here. It doesn't look like there's any special fancy markings. Hopefully I didn't ruin the intonation too much. <laughs> but it does have this fancy Apollonie inlay right there. Looks like it's made out of ebony. And then you've just got the gold thumb wheels right here, kind of ABR1 in style to adjust your action up and down. So no metal saddles on this one. So it's very reminiscent of like the old arch tops, you know, super fancy stuff. But take a look at this tailpiece. How cool is that? It's got the Gibson branding right there. And then once again, an ebony block, you know, kind of like the ebony block vibrolas from the early 60s. This one, it's just a block within the tailpiece. Kind of looks like a, a disfigured face of a woman. Like there's two eyes, a nose, and like a mouth. And that's her big 80s hair, because you know this was made in the 80s. <laughs> But the back side of this, it looks like they just kind of glued that to these pieces, to these ends, and that's what just makes it stay in, I guess. And it broke my heart. The second owner of this one, the guy I got it from, he installed a Bigsby on it. It's like, no! Because <laughs> it was funny, he had this listed on Reaver, but he ended up taking it down. And since I was in the market for really special Gibson pieces, I messaged him, I'm like, do you still have this guitar? And it turned out he did. And so I was asking him a couple of questions and he eventually stopped me. He's like, hey, are you actually interested in this or are you just like all the other time wasters that were just sending me a bunch of messages because it was a beautiful guitar wanting to know more. That's why he had took the listing down because he was tired of uh, entertaining people that weren't actually serious about buying it. But he had put a like new old stock 60s Bigsby on here and thankfully, Thankfully, it's not the kind you drilled the top for. So I ultimately decided, okay, I'm just gonna let that pass. Here's what it looks like with the tailpiece taken off. So it utilizes three screws itself. That's one of your strap button holes. It looks like maybe it was moved at one point in time. So the Bigsby that he had on here, really the only other new hole was pretty much right there. And here's the back side of this. Like I was really hoping we'd find some signatures or like it said NAM show or something on it. But unfortunately, uh, I'm not finding anything like that. But the only one that was visible outside of the tailpiece was right here. And he was gracious enough to fill that in for me. Honestly, I couldn't even see it until I turned the guitar on its side. So I'm glad I didn't let that scare me away from this instrument. So that's pretty cool. And now these knobs. I was really, really hoping that this one was gonna have my favorite style knobs because around 1983, this is like what they used on the Spotlight Specials. They're slightly more UFO'd in shape. They have a distinct skirt to them. They come to a point and they've got like a certain glitter gloss within them. They're really cool. They're my favorite knobs Gibson has ever made. But unfortunately, this one utilized a slightly later prehistoric style knob. Which I guess in 83, you might start to see these as early as like 84, so maybe this was a pretty late 83. But they do glow under black light, and they match my other examples that I have down here. But honestly, I don't feel like those match the guitar. I would not be opposed to, you know, getting somebody to custom commission like a The Les Paul style knob, because I think that's what this should have had. I mean, it's got the rings, it's got the headstock veneer, it's even got the switch tip, as you can see here, the exact same shape that those guys used. So maybe I'll have to do that as just a modification for myself. Because... Oh man, that's kind of cool. It looks like a, a phoenix. Like it's breathing fire. Maybe we could call it a dragon, you know, tie it in with the Trogley's guitar show. But that's like its wings, that's its tail. But sadly, that kind of gets covered up by the tailpiece. So we'll just continue to call this thing the hippo. Here's a closer look at one of the pickup rings. So this is exactly how the V Les Pauls were too. They had the finish on the top, but not on the inside. So it was likely the exact same people that ended up making these as well. Or it was just left over. So let's try to painstakingly put these back in. I will say though that it was definitely worth lowering those knobs. But moving on from our gorgeous body, let's check out this neck finally. So this is an ebony fretboard, and as I was telling you earlier, it's multi-bound, so you get a white, black, and white layer. So kind of similar to like what they did with Antique Natural Spotlight Specials, and that also forms the nibs, so that's just ultra fancy stuff here. And beautiful ebony fretboard with, once again, the abalone inlays, again, like a The Les Paul. But honestly, I would say these inlays are quite intricate. It's like each of them has like its own unique painting on the inside. Like this one kind of looks like an owl or an eye. Uh, that one, not too sure. 
I'm sure you could find something in some of these. It's just, you know, kind of interesting. They used really high-end stuff, and that makes sense for this being a NAM show display piece. They're really trying to show off what they could do. Here's an up-close look at that nut. So it appears to be made of like bone and then maybe a dyed red wooden material, but you can see it's scalloped in between, meaning they carve it out like that. Why do they do that? I'm not sure if there's actually a real reason other than it looks fancy. But it's the headstock veneer that made me fall in love with this. It's not just black, it's not just a regular holly veneer. They went through and did a rosewood veneer here. Now it's not like the body. Like the body, if you get it at certain angles, you can see kind of like what looks like finish checking. All that is, is the finish has absorbed into the wood grain. It's not cracks or anything crazy like that. Now, sometimes it can be, but this particular one, that's just the lacquer kind of absorbing into the body. But they must have put more lacquer over top of this one because you don't get that same effect. But you can still see, you know, the beautiful wood grain underneath. And the abalone there, you know, this is the abalone that looks great. Sometimes abalone can be a little bit too much, but I think this is the version that I like. And of course, who doesn't like the Grover Imperial style, you know, Ace Frehley type stuff here. That's pretty cool stock from the factory. And our truss rod is looking to be in good shape. However, it does appear that they uh, made a boo-boo at the factory. Somebody filled in a little hole there. I was curious, like maybe were these things added after the fact? So I lined it up, that looks okay. It, it never actually should have went there. And then I took a regular truss rod cover to see, okay, maybe is that one bigger? But no, that one lines up perfectly too, so I'm not sure what that's about. As far as neck specs, 1.56 inch nut width. So it's got that kind of skinnier nut width that some people might not like. And 2 inches by the 12th. 0.77 is your first fret neck depth. And by the 12th, it beefs up to 1. So it starts off rather skinny and thin, but then it gets a little bit wider and a little bit chunkier. Now this neck profile to me, it is really rounded. So I actually find it pretty comfortable so far. It looks like the scale length is 24 and a half inches. So a little bit shorter than the regular Gibson scale. But there we go, one beautiful guitar. This is such a resonant instrument. I would use this as like an acoustic and I think that's because it doesn't have that center block running through it. Let's check out the sides real quick. So even the sides are the rosewood. Now I'm guessing this is probably Brazilian just like the other crest instruments. My best guess at this point in time is this thing was actually created in the mid 70s and was never finished until later on for the NAMM show. Or you gotta remember, since that pickup is an 83, it's very possible that this is a 1983 made instrument. And you know, 84 is when Kalamazoo was shutting down. So maybe they just happened to find, you know, old crest parts and like a 355 neck that was already stamped. They decided to put these things together and then display it there. That's my best guess on this one. But there's a good look at the hippo, one eye, second eye, nostrils. This is a very clean instrument. You can tell it's definitely collector owned. Not too much wear and tear in general. Now to me, it looks like this top strap button has been replaced, but who really knows? And here you can see the three piece mahogany neck on this. Wouldn't that have been cool if it was a rosewood neck on a vintage Gibson? These are the vintage Grover tuners. Honestly, they feel like they're slipping a little bit, so they probably should be changed. But you know, for the sake of originality, I think I'll just let it be. But there we go. This is a strange one. 202963. Custom Shop Edition, made in USA. As far as the weight goes, it weighs 6 pounds, 2.3 ounces. Let's go ahead and plug it in. Okay, so first thing I'm noticing about this thing, it's a little bit neck heavy. <laughs> Guess the center block could have helped with that. But it's got some nice, really sweet tones to it. I mean, listen to this neck pickup. Position's pretty nice too. Then you can 
also switch over to your bridge position. Very nice mellow tones out of this thing. Am I gonna lie and say it's my favorite sounding guitar? No, not necessarily. It's definitely more for like a jazzy stuff, which is kind of my style, but not necessarily what I wanna play right now. <laughs> so let's go ahead and try some distortion on this thing. Usually not having that center block means we're gonna have some sort of a feedback. And that's definitely the case. So this demo is with my volume knobs turned almost all the way down. So all in all, it's a really nice guitar, but I'm not gonna say it's my favorite. It was not love at first strum, unfortunately. It's a beautiful guitar though, and I think that's where all the value of this one comes from due to its obscurity and rarity and just beauty in general. I mean, you don't find many Gibson guitars from 1980 that has potentially Brazilian rosewood or really any type of rosewood body at all. So for that, I think the Hippo is very fantastic. But as far as something that I think somebody should gig, yeah, probably not. I mean, it's in such clean shape anyways, it should likely be a collector's piece, unfortunately. But, you know, it's kind of an interesting version of the Crest. 
Some other things I'm noticing that are kind of annoying while playing this thing is it has that whole fret edge binding gap where your top E string will get stuck in it. It kind of makes doing bends a little bit difficult, especially when it gets stuck in there. So it's like you don't really want to play this thing too much or you might risk uh, cracking some of the binding off that. But it has great acoustic presence. <laughs> This is not something I'll be listing publicly for sale. It's kind of one of those things that I'll probably just hold on to unless somebody wants to offer me a whole bunch of money. But I definitely wanted to document this piece. All right, troglodytes, thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.